everyone. Um, welcome. My name is James Armitage. Um, I'm an optometrist and I'm the um, optometry course director in the School of Medicine at Deakin University down in Geelong in Victoria. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be able to um, be part of this um, Glaucoma Awareness Week and to talk about dry eye and glaucoma. Um, I'm a university lecturer. Um, I'm used to having students in front of me. So this is a little bit um, funny not seeing anyone's reactions. Um, but um, please ask as many questions as you like. They're coming through to me on my phone and um, I'm more than happy to stop and take questions as we go through. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, so I graduated it seems like four or 500 years ago um, in 1995 from the University of Melbourne. And I've um, spent the last um, 25 or so years working on um, as a clinical optometrist, um, working as a researcher. Um, I have a particular interest in glaucoma in dry eye as is for my clinical practice, but also some of my research. So as I said, we'll, we'll wander through, I've prepared a bit of a, um, a a sort of a talk, but I am more than happy um, to take your questions. Um, but I will begin by acknowledging um, that we are gathered here. Um, I'm I'm living on Wathaurong country and I'd like to pay my respects um, to the Wathaurong people, the custodians of this lands, their elders past, present and emerging. So um, this is a, I think this is a, a really lovely um, drawing done by uh, a young Wathaurong man by the name of Zach. He was 10 in 2018, so he's he's probably uh, um, well on the way to being a young man. But this was his take on um, the importance of eye care um, for him. All right, so I will just get my face back up. Not that it really matters. Um, but let's start about what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about dry eye. Um, I'd like to talk about what it is how it's diagnosed and classified. And I think that's kind of important because um, for many of us, when we first get um, diagnosed with a condition, um, there can be this overwhelming amount of information or not enough information. And I think having a chance just to sit and, and have a chat about some of these things um, may help um, some of you. So we'll talk about diagnosis and classification because that actually leads into management and how we best manage dry eye disease. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, why glaucoma management crosses over with dry eye disease. And really it's around what we put in the glaucoma meds that, that make them work. Um, and also whether they be the active ingredients and also some of the other things that we put in drops um, that help them stay safe, they keep them preserved, um, but they may also um, affect you. So let's kick off. So I'll begin just by um, saying that, you know, obviously I'm talking here. Um, I don't know you guys. I don't know your individual case. So the best person to discuss this really is your optometrist, your ophthalmologist, whoever you see regularly, um, because they know you. Um, and then it gives you the opportunity to talk to them and tell them what, what you really need. And they can then give you that personalized information. So this is all pretty general. Um, I don't receive any personal inducements or consultancies. Um, that's very disappointing, I can tell you, but, um, and I'm not really talking about medical um, or non-medical dry eye treatments here, um, but um, I just want to declare that I have been the recipient of a research grant from a company called Luminous who produce um, uh, an intense pulse light device and also a PI on a clinical trial that's currently undergoing um, phase two trials by a company called Azura. Okay, so dry eye is, uh, it, it's a multifactorial disease and it really is um, caused by a load of things. And I'll, I'll give you the sort of the, the definition, but then we'll probably break it down a little bit. So it's caused by a load of things, it's multifactorial. It really is about the ocular surface, the front of the eye, and it, it, it's characterized by a change in the tear film, um, a loss of that homeostatic mechanism that keeps the tear film of a particular level of saltiness and acidity based basic nature, whether it's its pH, um, 
And when that changes, it causes symptoms. The deer film can become unstable, can become too salty, and then it irritates the cells at the front of the eye causing uh, inflammation. And once that inflammation has started, then it kind of rolls like a, you know, like a rock down a hill um, and it starts causing um, annoying symptoms and also damaging symptoms eventually. So the tear film itself, um, this sounds a little bit like a first year anatomy lecture, but it is important that we talk about the tear film because I guess when we think about tears, we know that they're liquid, um, but they're actually really, really complex. And again, understanding something about the tear film can help us um, work out what sort of um, medications or um, tear supplements might be useful for you. So here's the front of the eye, here's the cornea, and we have here um, the, the cells at the front of the eye, and they are, um, they have these mucins, which are like, it's, it's like mucus, um, which attach to the epithelium, and then these mucins, which are sticky, attach to other um, mucins in the tear film, and then we have this sort of gradient layer of mucin, a type of mucus, and then in this water layer, which we all know of. And it's capped off by a lipid layer. And that lipid layer is important as well, because the lipid stops that water layer from evaporating. So we've got this really, really complex um, tear film that's renewed every 10, 15 seconds every time we blink. So we have the mucins that produce structure, they give it some gel, some viscosity, otherwise it'd just fall off. We have the water, the aqueous phase, and then the, the lipids. And when we look at tear supplements and the things that we use to try and improve tear film, they may have lipids in them. Um, they may have these gelling agents in them, not mucins, because we can't um, manufacture exactly the same things that are in the tears. Um, but we can put these gelling agents in. And if, then of course, there's the aqueous layer, the, the liquid layer. So by talking about it, hopefully um, you can see that it's important that we are picking the right tier supplement. So it's not just a matter of which is the one that's on the um, shelf and which is the, um, the cheapest at any one time. Um, it's about what's gonna help you the most. So the tear film is actually really important. Um, and the best description I can give you for this is that um, here's a windscreen on a rainy day. Um, we've all we all know what the windscreen's like on a rainy day. The tear film is actually the first oh, sorry, I'm just getting a call through. I'm just trying to shut that off. The, the tear film is the first surface that light hits as it hits our eye. So if our tear film is bumpy, like it is here on the window, then you can see it's just not very clear. The glass is clear, but the, the water is actually distorting our vision. And every time we blink, our lids, just like the wipers in our car, every time we blink, the, the, the lids come down and they draw up a brand new tear layer, um, nice and fresh, nice and clear, like it is on this side of the windscreen. Um, and that lipid layer at the top of protects it from evaporation. If there's not enough water, if there's too much lipid or not enough lipid, too much mucin or not enough mucin, then that tear film's not stable and it collapses and it dries out. And if it collapses and dries out, then the cornea and, and the rest of the eye underneath the tear film starts getting exposed to the atmosphere. Um, and then that cornea, those corneal cells become unhappy. Um, so you've probably all been, when you've been to the optometrist or the ophthalmologist, they would have put um, a fluorescein dye and it's that, that bright orange dye we then stick you behind a big uh, blue light. And we look at how that dye distributes through the tear film. So we've put the dye in, there's some pictures over here. Um, you've just had a blink. 0.7 of a second after you've blinked, you can see there's a beautiful, smooth tear film layer. After two seconds in this person who's got dry eye, you can see now it's starting to become a little uneven, isn't it? So you can see that there's a little bit of a break here. Um, by 
three seconds, it's starting to get a little bit worse. By seven seconds, it's even worse. There's, there's no tears under this area here. And by 10 seconds, this person's going to be feeling pretty uncomfortable because the cells under here um, and the nerves under here are drying out. And so we feel that as a dry eye symptom. Additionally, if this tear film um, is really thin and if it's, there's not enough water in it, then it becomes quite salty. And again, we don't need to think too hard about this. You know what it's like. You put your head in the ocean, it's a really salty ocean, your eyes sting It's because it's overly salty water. Interestingly, you put your, your eyes under the shower um, where there's no salt or very little salt in, in shower water. And that feels uncomfortable as well because if there's not enough salt, then um, that's called um, hypoosmolarity. It's not salty enough and that's not comfortable either. Whereas if you put in a tear supplement, um, which are balanced, then usually um, you don't feel it as being uncomfortable at all. So that tear supplement, uh, that, that tear film breaking down is what we see as dry eye. <coughs> Excuse me. And there are loads of reasons why that happens. Um, so it could be the gland that produces the water part, the aqueous phase becomes dysfunctional. Um, it could be the, the glands that produce the oil layer, the lipid layer become dysfunctional. And you can see these here. Um, these are the little gland openings on the, on the top of, oh, just on the margin of the lid. And you can see that they're, um, the, the lipid in there has become really quite um, thick and it's almost um, like toothpaste consistency. And this lipid, you can imagine, is not going to spread very well over the top of this tear film um, and it's not going to protect it very well. So we can have dysfunction of these glands that produce the oil. It's called myobum. Um, the other thing is that we can lose the cells that produce the mucin. So as the eye dries out over many months, years, um, the, the cells that produce this mucin disappear, they die off and they're, they're replaced by other cells that don't produce mucin. So then we end up with a position where our tear film isn't jelly enough. And <clears throat> again, what that means is that it just sort of falls off the eye. It doesn't stick to those mucins that are bound within the epithelium and it falls off. Um, and again, many, many things can call this age. The older we get, the, the, the more likely it is that we'll get this dysfunction the environment we live in, if it's dusty, if it's hot, if it's humid, if it's um, very windy. Our diet, we know that not enough water will mean that you have a dry mouth. And if you've got a dry mouth um, because you've not drunk enough water, then very similarly, it means the glands that are taking um, water from your blood to make your saliva don't have enough water. And it's the same thing, the gland, the lacrimal gland that takes um, fluid from your blood to make the um, lacrimal secretions will also um, not have enough water. Systemic medications, whether they be some of our blood pressure medications, uh, people who are taking medications to um, reduce the, um, the amount of, uh, you know, if they've got urine um, incontinency, there are some people who will be taking medication that reduce um, water. All of those things um, do cause dry eye problems. But for most of us in, in this um, arena, I guess we're, we're thinking about, um, you know, about dry eye medication. We're thinking about glaucoma medication. But there's also other things like lids. So, you know, the analogy I gave you right at the start about the windscreen wiper, every time our, our car wiper comes over, it produces a nice clean film of water on our windscreen. Um, if the wiper's nicked and bumpy, then it'll be streaky, it'll be messy. And again, if we look here at somebody's lid here, this is um, the top of someone's lid. And you can see it's not a flat straight line. It's kind of a bit bumpy there. That's the, the tears, that's the tear meniscus right down the bottom of the eye and sitting on the lid. And so as this lid closes, opens, closes, opens, maybe it's not spreading the tears so well across and you end up with a dry area. <clears throat> and again, you can see here, there's no um, green glow from our drops that we've put in here because that they've dried out, they're no longer there. And there's the little starry dots um, are cells that are really unhappy. They've either died or um, they're sick and that's because they've dried out. 
There are there are loads of causes, and I just wanted to put this up. We won't talk about it too much um, because, again, this is sort of a you know this is a a second year optometry um, type lecture. But what I wanted to point out is there are so many things. The amount of time we blink, whether we're on um, screens, and lots of us are on screens all the time. Um, whether we have antihistamines or beta blockers, diuretics, um, some psychotropic drugs whether we've got a thing called Sjogren's syndrome or our lacrimal gland doesn't produce um, uh, water very well, or whether we have an oil issue or maybe <clears throat> an extrinsic issue, something about a vitamin A deficiency or allergy, something like that. So for you as the patient, I think, you know, you, you, you want to know what's going on. We, we've sort of talked about this tear film, how complex it is, how it can break down. And when it does, it exposes the tissues in the eyes um, to the atmosphere. And if it's a hot day, if it's a windy day, um, then you dry out. And so you experience a red eye, that dry eye, um, burning and stingy. Um, someone asked about whether um, having dry eyes makes your eyes itchy. And um, itch, it depends on how you're um, describing itchiness, Angela, because, um, Yes, they can feel sort of a bit irritated, but if they're really itchy, like a mosquito bite, um, often that's more of an indication of some sort of allergy, whether it be a dust allergy or a pollen allergy. Um, but yes, dry eye can cause that irritation that makes you want to rub them um, to, to make them feel better. Your eyes can just feel tired because um, you're spending all day and they're, they're not lubricated and they feel untired, uh, they feel uncomfortable. And you can also get this blurry, unstable vision. Again, the analogy of that, um, the windscreen wiper, if the tear film's not good, then we don't see very well. I'm, I'm not sure how many of you experience this, but many of my dry eye patients um, tell me that they have a real problem, that they've got this wet eye. They don't think of it as dry eye, they think of it as wet eye, that everything's going all right. And then suddenly their eyes feel a bit dry and then suddenly it's like they're crying. There's this sort of big tear of um, a, a amount of tears that come out. And it really does need explaining, hey, because it seems really funny because then when I say to them, oh, that's because you've got dry eye, um, many of them think um, I'm just a little bit mad because what happens is that our eyes get dry. And, and perhaps if you can remember, if we go back a couple of slides here, um, how our tear film's broken down because of the dry eye. Um, and the cells that are sitting under here are going to be really unhappy um, because they're dry. Um, they're being exposed to the heat, the air conditioning, the atmosphere. Um, they're not happy at all. And the nerves that live there detect that um, and they get irritated. Now, we developed from animals um, and we, we developed, you know, not necessarily having a clean environment. We were digging around in the dirt. And so there is this natural reflex that if we get something in our eye and the, the nerves in our, the front of our eye detect that there's an irritation, we assume that that's a hair or a piece of dirt or a bit of dust or, you know, something that's come from the atmosphere. And what's the best way to get rid of that? Well, the best way to get rid of it is to send a signal to the lacrimal gland, which lives um, just up, up here. I'll move my head. Um, just up here is the lacrimal gland that produces the, the watery part of our tears. Um, and so the lacrimal gland thinks that there's something in the eye. So let's flood the eye with tears and wash it out. Um, so that works really well if our, if our irritated eye was caused by um, a, a, a stick or a, you know, a twig or a um, hair or um, some sand at the beach. But if it's because of the dry eye, then we get this massive flood of tears. <clears throat> Everyone feels okay for you know, 20, 30 seconds. Um, but because that tear film's not stable, then after 10, 20, 30 seconds, um, you get dry eye again. And then 10 minutes later, you'll get this other tearing going on. So I think it's it's a it's a really useful um, again thing to think about. So if you're getting that teary wet eye. Um, we need to think about managing your dry eye um, so that it doesn't happen. And often what it means is that we need to be then um, getting ahead of this and managing it 
and getting those drops in before the uncomfortable symptoms start um, because then that keeps that tear film stable. All right, so by now we've sort of painted this picture of how the tear film um, can become um, low quality or unstable. Um, and I'm guessing, you know, most of you want to know how we can get rid of it. And, and that's where um, dry eye therapy comes in. And as I said, I would suggest that if you're having dry eye, go to your optometrist, go to your ophthalmologist and talk to them about it. And, and go to someone who will spend the time with you and do a full workup and get to the bottom of, is it a lack of water that's causing it? Is it an oil problem that's causing it? Is it irritation and therefore the mucus layer is not working so well because once we know what's causing it rather than just putting a generic drop on we can try and target that drop um, to do the right thing so it may well be that we need to give you a tear seal supplement that has lots of water in it um, or one that has um, increases the stability has these um, gelling agents in it um, or we need to find something that increases the amount of lipid in your tear film to prevent um, evaporation. When I see patients quite often, um, the first thing we do is talk about inflammation because usually they've had dry eye for you know years and years and years before and it's got to the stage where they're really annoyed about it um, and then they wanna do something about it. So it's a long-term thing. And the first thing we wanna do is break that inflammatory cycle. So. Um, the first thing I often do is work um, out what's causing the dry eye and then we put on a steroid for usually a couple of weeks to just to quieten down all the inflammation. All those cells that have been drying out, that have been putting out signals saying they're unhappy and causing this inflammation, we need to quieten them down um, before we can start um, repairing the damage. Um, now, for, for some people, um, steroids can increase eye pressure and of course for anyone with glaucoma we always want to be super careful that we're not changing eye pressure that we're not causing these spikes or um, an increase in eye pressure because then that can affect your optic nerve um, so for all of our patients um, we can think about a whether putting uh, a steroid on is a problem and it's it's often not to be honest for people with glaucoma but it's something I always think about um, and for those who can't use a steroid, um, there are T cell inhibitors. Cyclosporin is a drop that's becoming uh, available more and more. Um, and it has been shown to reduce the inflammation um, and improve dry eye. Uh, so for some of the, I, I think there are some um, optometrists on, I think. Um, so that could be, I can't see the picture, um, but there's someone from um, Canterbury Eye Care. So there's um, new new drugs coming onto the market. Um, the TGA has now, um, has approved um, Sequa, which is a cyclosporin, and it is available on the special access scheme. Um, and if anyone's interested in that and doesn't know how to get onto the special access scheme, any of the um, optoms there, um, send me an email and we can talk about it because we, we've been um, at Deakin, we've been getting some of our patients who, who do have dry eye that's not responding to other things. We've been getting them access to Sequa on the SES. But there are loads of drops that we can use. And, and really it's about, you know, trying to work out which ones are going to do the trick. So where is my mouse going? Okay, the other thing that we can do is if we know that your dry eye is caused by um, a lack of that water phase, that the aqueous, um, we can put in um, small plugs into the, into the tear um, drainage system um, and they will um, sort of just slow down um, the amount of water leaving the eye um, and that, sorry, I'm just getting my phone up here so I can see the questions coming through. So if we slow down the, the amount of water leaving the eye, it just stays in the eye longer um, and makes things in, uh, more comfortable. There are also stimulators um, that can increase tear production. 
Um, I've never used one, um, but they they actually go in your nose and they just basically stimulate your nose. You know, if you if you tickle your nose, it can make your eyes water, and that increases the amount of um, water. So, dry eye. I've got some questions now. Um, so. I've got some questions from Angela. Um, is dry eye a symptom of blepharitis? So absolutely, um, if you've got blepharitis, then you can end up with dry eye. Um, there are two forms of blepharitis. Blepharitis just means inflammation. The itis bit is inflammation and blepharo is the lid. So it's just inflammation of our lids. Um, so if you if we have a look at our lids here you can see um, this lower lid perhaps uh, just down here um, we can have inflammation around at the front part and um, it causes uh, and often that's caused by um, just an overgrowth of bacteria we have bacteria all over our bodies um, and um, that overgrowth of bacteria um, can cause irritation because as the bacteria let out their waste products um, our eyes get irritated by them. There's also a thing called posterior blepharitis or meibomian gland dysfunction, where we're talking about the back part of the eye being inflamed. And we saw that back here. So, oh, actually this is a nice photo. So here's some anterior blepharitis. There's um, just some, you can see those little crusty um, deposits there on the in the lids and on the lashes. That's at the front that causes irritation because of the bacteria that live in there um, that can then just irritate the eye. And this is our posterior blepharitis um, or meibomian gland dysfunctions. And the meibomian glands are those things that produce the oil. So both of those um, can and will cause um, dry eye. Um, how do the lid wipes help, Angela? Well, the lid wipes help by removing the um, the bacteria and removing the, those little crusty um, deposits that I showed you just before. Um, and by keeping them clean, if there's no food for bacteria, then the bacteria um, die back a little bit. There aren't as many of them and our eyes don't detect the waste products that they're producing. And so we just lose um, one of the things that could be causing that irritation. So um, I often ask um, my patients, and again, this is again why we probably take, I think it reckon it takes me about half an hour in often in its own consultation where we work through um, the, the dry eye and what's causing it. So if I see that there's um, lots of that, that crusty stuff on the lids, then um, we'll talk about um, those wipes, whether it be something called SteriLid um, or I think Sistane also have some wipes um, and they're really good because they clean away gently um, without irritating the eye. They clean away any food for the bacteria and that um, reduces the discomfort. So the wipes will be absolutely no use if you don't have that anterior blepharitis because, um, you know, your dry eye may not be caused by um, that, that aspect. So this is why I say it's really important we sort of spend the time to, to work out what's causing the discomfort. Oh, and it's Laura at um, Canterbury. How are you going, Laura? So the other thing that we can do for, for the lipids, apart from giving you um, drops that contain lipids, is that we can try and get those glands producing nice, um, really slippery and easily expressed oil. Um, and often the best way to do that is to warm it up warm up the lid um, in, a, in a safe way. Um, and there are a couple of ways that we can do this. We can do it with goggles. There are some goggles that um, we put a single use, um, a little paper insert that's, that's wet. Um, and then the goggles warm up. They look like a pair of um, strange swimming goggles. And when those goggles warm up, they produce this nice warm, moist environment. Warm the lids up, warm the lipid that's got a little bit um, it's got a little bit hard and um, isn't coming out so well. We warm that up and then we just gently express it. And that can either be just with a cotton bud that we roll down with a cotton bud and remove the um, the the oil here. 
um, and allowed the glands to produce this fresh, um, much more slippery and um, runny oil. Um, the other thing we can do is gently um, squeeze with some special for forceps. Uh, you can also do that at home. So um, there are heat packs, they're called a Bruder mask. It's like a wheat bag. You heat it up and you place it on the eye um, and then you have to massage the, the lids and get um, the that thicker oil out. And that really does help. Um, and that's something that often I ask my patients to do is just part of their sort of their morning routine. Um, have a shower, it's nice and warm, and then um, use use that heat pack and um, express the, the sort of thick um, lipid and leave the nice runny stuff in there because then it'll help your tear film. We can also um, work with your ophthalmologist or GP um, to get you some uh, tetracyclines, which is a uh, doxycycline. Um, it's an antibiotic that actually has some really great anti-inflammatory actions and, and helps there. So there's loads of things we can do. Um, and I think it's part of the, the, the journey, uh, journey here is trying to get you um, onto the right um, dry eye treatment. Um, they're basically broken down into these lubricants and humectants, which is hum it just increases liquid. Um, and they stabilize the tear film. Um, and the other thing they do is they wash out some of the inflammatory compounds produced by the eye. And the lipid supplements um, stabilize that layer and um, act as a, a um, barrier to evaporation. But people, some people, um, their eyes just open very slightly overnight while they're sleeping, so it dries out. And so sometimes we'll produce, um, we'll suggest a really thick lubricant, um, something like a paraffin-based um, lubricant that you put in right before you go to bed. It does, it does um, make your eyes a bit sticky and a bit blurry, but that's all right. You do it right before you go to bed, um, and then um, it keeps them lubricated and it's a barrier overnight. As a rule, it's the thicker tear supplements last for longer, um, but they do cause a bit more blur. So in many ways, I think it's a bit of a balancing act, right? Um, wouldn't it be great if we could give you this really lovely thick gel that would sort of, you know, really um, support the tear film? And we can, only problem is that when you first put them in um, for five or 10 minutes, it might be a bit blurry. Um, on the other hand, you know, we can give you um, really thin ones that don't mess with your vision at all. In fact, they'll improve your vision almost instantaneously, but they don't last very long. Um, so it's it's really, it is a bit of a, a, a game to play to try them out. There are lots of different brands, lots of different types. Um, I have my favorites and my patients have their own favorites and we just work through them together. Um, once you know what's in the drop, um, your pharmacist is also a really great um, person to work with because if you say to them, look, I just want a carbama, you know, 0.3% carbama, they will then say, oh, you can use this or this or this, um, and they can give you that advice you need. A lot of people use vasoconstrictors, um, and I, I really want to say, please don't. Um, so these are things like Albalon A, um, Visine, um, they can contain a, a vasoconstrictor, which just shuts the blood vessels down. So we've got these dry, irritated um, red eyes. We put the vasoconstrictor in, it causes the blood vessels at the front of the eye to shut down. Um, and that's great. So the eye goes nice and white. You think, oh gosh, it's helped. It's got rid of the redness. Um, and it feels better because it is wet. Um, but what happens then is, and, and it feels better for a while because your blood vessels actually bring in some of the inflammatory things that are um, irritating in dry eye. Um, but really, it's a little bit like um, there's a, an old fashioned furnace there. Um, it's a bit like having a roaring fire in a furnace. And the vasoconstrictor is a bit like the door. You put the vasoconstrictor in, the door shuts. It's no longer hot outside. And you say, awesome, that's worked so well. Um, until 20 minutes later when the door opens again as the vasoconstrictor runs out of action um, and then the fire is still there. You haven't put the fire out. You haven't dealt with the symptoms. Um, you've just um, you know, put things away for a few minutes. And actually, interestingly, there's often a rebound. Um, so when the 
that when those vasoconstrictors wear off, they open up, the blood vessels open up even more. It's kind of even more uncomfortable. So stay away from those, I think. So I'm not sure how many um, people we've got on. I don't know um, how many people are having trouble with their um, with their glaucoma and their dry eye. Um, but we know that dry eye is pretty common. It's anywhere from you know, 10 to 30% in the general population. But people with glaucoma often report a, a higher um, amount of dry eye. So anywhere from 40 to 50, 40 to 60% of people experience dry eye. And the reason for that is often glaucoma um, happens in the fifth, sixth, seventh decade of life. Um, and dry eye often happens fifth, sixth, seventh um, decade of life. So there is that aging factor. Um, none of us like to be told that things are happening because we're getting older, um, but it is. Um, but the other thing that occurs is that we know that some of our glaucoma medications, those drugs that are so important for keeping your pressure down, um, can also affect um, the, the tear production. So beta blockers um, can reduce tear production. Um, the alpha agonists can cause a little bit of irritation. And the prostaglandin analogues, um, things like Zalatan, Latanoprost, which are so, they were, they were absolute game changers when those drugs came out um, because they improved eye pressure control out of sight. Um, but the way they work is that, particularly the PGAs, they actually work by um, changing, but they are slightly pro-inflammatory. Um, and that's how they work. It's really important. They're awesome. Um, but they do cause a little bit of irritation. So just by nature of the drops, um, there is a little bit of um, a chance of dry eye from them. The other thing is that often our drops are preserved with a thing, or they're preserved. Um, there are many different types, but there's one chemical, particularly benzalkonium chloride or BAC, um, which with over time can um, cause irritation in and of itself. And so if you're taking you know, if you're taking your glaucoma drops twice a day and they're back um, and, and they're back preserved and then you, you're taking some dry eye supplements to help and that's back preserved as well, then after a while, um, not, not you know, a week or uh, a month, but after years, you can start to develop this hypersensitivity. So, yeah, so um, we just had a question about whether people using glaucoma drops suffer from dry eyes more than the normal population or the general population. And yes, I think I think that's fair to say. Um, so, you know, I guess that's just one of the side effects of um, the glaucoma meds. Um, and in in many ways, I think it's one of those things that we just have to work um, to to try and circumvent and get around. So we know that these drops contain active ingredients and then these other stabilizing ingredients and either can annoy you. Um, and um, I think just a, a plug for um, some of the other um, talks that are on this week, it's a, it's a really um, great resource. So I believe that Jessica Lung will be talking on Thursday about some of the side effects of the glaucoma meds. Um, so you might wanna tune in to, to hear about that. Now, uh, I don't have glaucoma, um, so it's not for me to say, well, the side effects aren't that bad or that good or whatever else. Um, but, you know, I, I do know people um, who have glaucoma and I do know people who take those those drops. And some people complain that the side effects are really quite, um, the dry eye effect is quite bad. Um, and others say, look, it's a little irritating, but, um, you know, we can work around it. So it is personal. Some people are going to be affected more and others um, less. I just want to put, give a plug for this photo that um, was a shortlist um, for one of the photos of the year. Um, it's, a, it's a drop, um, a single drop being placed on the human eye by Andre Castellan. Uh, it's a lovely photo. And I do want to apologise. I don't know if you can hear them. Um, nobody anticipated if we were going to be working from home in COVID and post COVID um, that my choice of putting the chicken coop outside of my home office that I only ever used at night um, prior to this um, would annoy me so much because at around 11 o'clock, which is what I'm guessing it is now, uh, my chickens start squirking. So apologies to them. 
Um, so you can see here that many dry iron, uh, many glaucoma drops are preserved. And here's a really um, nice example. So here's um, an eye, this person was using preserved glaucoma drops and they have a, a benzalkonium or back hypersensitivity. And where you can see that greenish hue is where we have um, unhappy cells on the eye because they, they don't like the back. Um, but just 15 days after changing to a non-preserved version of the same glaucoma medication, um, we now no longer have those grumpy cells here. It's a nice even tear film. So um, there are solutions and, and I think part of this talk, um, obviously I can't give all of you advice on what you need, um, but the best advice I can give is, you know, go and talk to the person who manages your glaucoma if you've got dry eye problems. Um, but lots of us use preserved eye drops as well. So don't, you know, I, I really don't want you to think at the end of this, oh my goodness, I really have to use um, non-preserved drops because if you're not having problems, don't worry. Um, we've, we've all used eye drops for years and years and years and, and back wouldn't be used if it was actively dangerous. It's just that some people do develop um, a hypersensitivity. The non-preserved options are usually more expensive because they're unit dosed um, and the options are a little more limited. So again, if you're not having problems, there's no need to switch um, to non-preserved. Um, you just stay with where you are because you'll be fine. But if you do have a demonstrated hypersensitivity, um, then depending on circumstances, you may be eligible for subsidized non-preserved options, either for your glaucoma and or um, for your um, dry eye, uh, and that's on the PBS. So um, there is there is definitely something that can be done if, if there are preservatives. So I'm, I'm just about to, to wind up here, but I think the message out of this is remember your glaucoma meds are priority number one. Um, and the reason for that is that um, if you've got dry eye, you're constantly reminded of it. Okay, it's uncomfortable or it's, um, it's they're red or they're, um, you know, they're a bit blurry or unstable vision. You get loads of signs and symptoms that tell you that your dry eye needs um, some attention. But as most of you know, um, un unless you have angle closure um, and it's symptomatic, but most of the time, um, you know, glaucoma just turns up and that you don't know you don't get any signs, you don't get any symptoms, you don't get any information um, from your eyes that'll um, cause you to feel un uncomfortable. So don't go, don't, don't change your glaucoma drops, just uh, stick with them. And then if there are problems, then talk to your um, eye health professional about changing them um, to a, a preserved, a non-preserved drop um, or something else. The other thing is to remember to um, always wait about 15 minutes between putting your dry eye drops and your glaucoma drops in because otherwise you'll just wash the um, each one of them out. So I don't think there's any particular reason to change if you're, um, if you're not having problems. Um, but I think hopefully from this, you, you'll, um, if you are having problems, go and talk to um, your optometrist or your ophthal, and they can discuss some of these options with you. Um, if you're interested in dry eye, there's this, um, the Tear Film Workshop um, and the Society have a really good patient summary. Um, and um, we can then, uh, and, and um, if you're interested um, in some of the, the activities of the drops that you're using, uh, MPS Medicine Wise is a really good um, resource. So there's last, um, there is a last question. I think we're winding up now. Um, there is a diet that can improve your dry eyes. A um, couple of meta-analyses. So these are um, studies of studies, studies of lots of studies. So combining results from um, thousands of patients, um, one from Bologna in Italy, uh, another one, which was about three and a half thousand people, another one um, recently from Laura Downey at the University of Melbourne. Um, in about 4,000 patients, showing that omega-3 supplements can improve um, your dry eye symptoms. Um, 
if the if oil uh, if if an oil problem was what was driving it in the first place. Um, so a, a good diet with lots of um, omega three in it will definitely um, give you an option there. The other thing is drink lots of water because if you're um, not hydrated, then um, sometimes your your lacrimal gland just can't produce the um, the watery part from your eyes, uh, from your tears that's required. All right, so I think we're just winding up. Um, I don't know if there are any last questions. I'm just checking my phone um, to make sure that there's nothing we need. No, I don't think there are any more questions. So um, thank you all for coming along and listening. Um, and uh, as always, happy um, for any of the optometrists if they would like to um, any more details on what I've talked about. Um, happy to um, you for you to send me an email. And um, for all the patients out there, I hope that um, your practitioners and you can work um, together and we can get rid of some of your dry eye symptoms as well. All right, so I'll uh, wind up now. Thank you all very, very much and enjoy the rest of your day. See you later.